Welcome to BBC Trending on location in the Bangladeshi capital, Dhaka. I'm Mukul Devachand, joined by an audience here and by my co-presenter, Sharmin Roma from BBC Bangla and the presenter of the weekly TV program, uh, BBC Prabaho, made here in Dhaka. So, how would you say hello to Dhaka? If I was to just say, hello Dhaka, would they say hello? Hello Dhaka. Hello. That's okay, but you know Mukul, in Bangla we don't just say hello. Uh, we use poetry. Really? Yeah, don't you know? Oh, no, I didn't know that. But yes, go Why on. don't you say, in this beautiful afternoon, how are you? Oh, wow. I'm glad everyone's feeling good. This is BBC Trending from the BBC team who live at bbc.com slash trending and spend our lives covering the global social conversation online. And this has been the year that the global internet debated the limits of free speech. Seven million people use social media to declare Je suis Charlie after the satirists of Charlie Hebdo were killed in Paris. And millions also use tags such as Muslim Lives Matter to protest the way these issues were covered by the mainstream media. Here in predominantly Muslim Bangladesh, a very intense echo of that global issue has taken hold. Since the beginning of the year, as we'll be hearing, three very vocal atheist and secular bloggers have been violently attacked and killed, seemingly by a shadowy world of Islamist militias. Roma, we're joined by a very illustrious panel to discuss social media and some of these issues. Can you introduce them, please? We are joined by Minister of Information, Hassanul Hakinu, a member of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's cabinet. We have uh, here with us popular blogger Arif Jiptik, known for being secular-minded despite his personal Islamic faith. And uh, we are joined here by International Relations Professor Amina Mohsin. Professor, I believe you have publicly criticized secular extremism in this country. Yes, I have. And we have Sarah Hussein, human rights lawyer. Hope you all are doing great. So, Roma, beyond the main story we're covering here, what kind of thing is trending in Bangladesh, does trend in Bangladesh? Well, more than 40 million Bangladeshis now use the internet in some form including their mobiles, that's a quarter of the population. So there is a lot trending. Now Roma Eid, the Muslim festival marking the end of the Ramadan fast, is just over. And on the internet, it seems like Eid selfies are a thing? Selfies really trending here. And it's really important for the selfie lovers to take selfies with family and friends on special occasions like Eid. How about you in the audience? Anybody have a, a fun selfie they did? I was the main one who was taking the selfie. My parents, they were just making faces. And it was good fun. Like, my parents became child with me. Also with my grandparents, because they didn't have it during their young age. So they're watching us, they're trying to make faces like... Okay, I just will describe to the world the face you did. It was like a, a pucker, like a... <laughs> duck face. Yeah, a duck face, yeah, exactly. Um, anybody else have, have or see any particularly fun selfies? I saw a picture where uh, a few friends were in their car, they were sitting at the uh, railing of their door while the car was moving and... While well, the uh, car was moving. moving yeah. I and just wanted, we do not recommend that anybody <laughs> listening to this try it at home. So I guess it should have been moving at a very moderate speed. So that cracked me up. And I've got something to share with you from your Minister of Information. He has been the subject of a couple of selfies uh, recently, Minister. Well, uh, coming and go, going out of the, the offices, any person can just come and say, OK, if you don't mind, let me have a picture. Sometimes I enjoy it, sometimes I, when I'm in a hurry, it's a little, little bit uh, embarrassing for me, but it doesn't matter. So they post it immediately, and they, after some time I get a telephone, OK, you are having a selfie with the, that person. <laughs> I'm coming to have another selfie with you. Oh, wow, Thanks. selfie fever. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and let's get on with the program. Let's move now to the main and somewhat disturbing story that we are covering here. Uh, Aviji Roy, Washiko Rahman, Anand Bijoy Das. These are the names of three bloggers who had big online followings and who wrote, sometimes very assertively, in favor of secularism and in some cases, atheism. 
Now, religion is a sensitive issue, of course, around the world, but the price they seem to have paid was very high indeed. All three men are now dead, all murdered in a similar way, being attacked in public places and hacked to death with machetes. Roma, what do we actually know about who did this? They appear to be killings by Islamist extremists. Uh, certainly that is what authorities say. So far the killers uh, have only been arrested in one of the cases and they were students from a madrasa. Another man named Farabi Shafi Rahman has been detained and he seems to have been an ideologue. Like, like an online ideologue? Yes. Calling for the death of of Jit Roy in particular, though no one has yet been charged for the killings. We've been speaking to the family of Avijit Roy, uh, the first blogger murdered this year, who actually came back from America, where his widow, Rafida Ahmed Bonia, still lives. We were getting back to the car, walking, holding hands. That's all I remember. That's all. What I remember next is uh, I'm in some kind of vehicle. Something is on my lap, heavy, and then I, I'm soaked in blood. She and her husband, Abhijit Roy, were attacked on a February night on the side of a busy road by a group of men wielding machetes who repeatedly slashed them. He was a well-known atheist and the moderator of a blog called Mukta Mona, or Free Thinking. He died that night and she was left injured. Yes, I have uh, four head wounds. They're like six, seven, eight inches machete wounds. Um, one hasn't healed properly in the back. I have... Uh, this sliced off. Um, my hands were cut so badly I had to go through like four hours of surgery to repair the nerves and the arteries. The men who attacked them haven't yet been arrested. Rafida Bonia Ahmed says her husband's killing and others since expose what she says is a culture of appeasement towards those who would use violence. It does signify, as I have mentioned before, that yeah, fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, culturally is taking a deep root in Bangladesh and these killers have gotten a free pass. Um, they think they can do whatever they want to. So I've seen this photo on the internet. I think it is in, in uh, somewhere in uh, Argentina. A photo of the couple in happier times hangs on the wall of Professor Ajoy Roy, Avijit's father. He says he told his son not to come back to Bangladesh. He rang me that he intends to come to Bangladesh. I advised him immediately that please don't come. You are a targeted person because you are known to be an atheist person because of your writings. He didn't listen to my advice. He never thought that he could be killed like this. I have also never thought. It was the father, Ajoy Roy, who actually started the Mukta Mona, or Free Thinking blog, which his son turned into a popular internet forum. Professor Roy took up arms in 1971 to help create an independent Bangladesh. It's personally it is very painful to me that the country for which I, I fought for independence and the price I have to pay is my son being killed, Obijit's mother. She now very rarely speaks. She just passed her days keeping silence. No, I don't have any regrets of what he did. He did to preach his own ideals. Playing with his children in a home he's now nervous to leave is Shobak. His name is on the widely circulated list of so-called atheist bloggers, mentioned six separate times. When Avijit Roy and the other bloggers were attacked and killed, that's when the fear started. Before that, it was okay. After that, we began fearing that they might kill us. So you softened your writing because of the fear? Yes. I don't feel free. I feel like I'm in an open-air prison. I always have to be careful. With us in the panel is Arif Jeptik. Now you are a secular blogger, although not an atheist. Are you concerned, frightened? Yeah, of course, of course. Every the uh, bloggers and activists, everyone is looking over their shoulder. They have changed their lifestyle. Some of them uh, lost their job or quit their job because of the security. Okay, so it's a big deal. One thing I want our audience listening to understand is there is a list circulating of 
such bloggers. It's become, in effect, a sort of a hit list now. But, but it began after something called the Shahbag movement, which was a street protest movement two years ago, which was begun and participated in by some of these same secular bloggers who are now dead. Can you tell it, us very briefly what was the Shahbag movement and how do you remember it? You know, Mukul, in uh, Bangladesh in 1970 war, there was a terrible war crime happened, but uh, later on we couldn't uh, bring them in uh, under the justice systems. Especially after the second generation of Bangladeshi, that's, we started fighting a, again that uh, those war criminals should be punished. Right, it's been going on, and this particular moment was when one person, Abdul Qadir Mullah, who is an Islamist, who was accused of war crimes and found guilty of war crimes right. during 1971. And secular bloggers took to the streets, started a movement calling for the full extent of the law to be used, which meant the death penalty. Yeah. And some people have called that protest movement something like a bungler spring, you know, yes. almost the analogy to the Arab Spring. Actually, on the global phenomena, yes, it, we can call it a uh, bungler spring. Uh, that time when Arab Spring came, it was followed by a uh, uh, Delhi and the corruption movement in the Dhaka, it was for the war criminals. So it was the frustration. We expressed our frustration in a very quick way, and movement was started from the online, and we less, later on uh, took the street. Right, so, and this was led initially by secular bloggers, although others joined. Uh, but it was prompted by people asking for this noted Islamist to receive the death penalty. And so it was also a challenge, in a sense, by secular voices, in particular to Islamic parties like the Jamaat-e Islami. Uh, and it was in the wake of that that the first blogger was actually killed, a man named Rajib Haider or Thaba Baba, a man who used to openly satirize the Islamic faith on, on his blog. And then this list was drawn up. Amina Mohsin, Professor Amina Mohsin, can you just tell us what was this list? What is the story of it? Okay, this was a list of the bloggers whom uh, the Islamist groups thought were using a kind of a hate uh, language in the blogs uh, against Islam. And it was uh, later on handed over to the Home Ministry. So it was handed over to the government. It became publicly known. Minister Inu, is that correct? Is that what happened? Some uh, groups who use religion and they gave certain list uh, to the Home Minister. That is one thing. But the point is that when the Shabak movement caught the imagination of the people and the whole Bangladesh was rallying behind this movement, the persons who are religious militants and all these things, they tried to divert the issue by raising the bogey that these book writers and bloggers are atheists and they are anti-Islamic. So they, they tried to divert the issue by attacking the bloggers. That is the thing. One question that uh, bloggers, some, some bloggers allege is that the way that it was dealt with by the government they don't feel was adequate. In particular, the fact that some bloggers from the secular stroke atheist side of the debate were actually arrested at that time. So they say, well, at the time that you were meant to be protecting us and when we were, we were being targeted, that the government was pursuing effectively an appeasement of the Islamic side of the debate. There are so-called Islamic militants, terrorists working on the one side, and certain uh, persons who are uh, known as bloggers has been arrested. Around, I have six, six persons have been arrested. They were arrested for posting blasphemous posts on the blogs, uh, coming up with very uh, derogatory comments about religion. So for that reason, uh, they have been arrested, and now at the moment, all are in bail. And they would say, I think, that if one thing for extremists to target us for our writing, but we shouldn't be arrested, uh, that, that undermines free speech. Well, uh, if you look into the... Uh, she's a... Sarah Hussain is a lawyer. She knows that uh, we have certain laws that you will not use religion in a wrong manner. If you incite somebody or incite disorder, then you are supposed to be arrested and face the trial. Sarah Hussain. The law is actually that you cannot hurt religious exactly, sentiment. Exactly. And correct. I think the concern many of us have is why can you not hurt religious sentiment but you can hurt secular sentiment as much as you want. And I think what the concern of some of those bloggers was, I represented four of them, was they felt they were going out there to demand war crimes trials and accountability out of conscience and out of a sense that that is what is right in Bangladesh. And for that, they, thank God they did not face murder. One of them did face physical assault. Phys Asif Muhyiddin is no longer able to be in the country, um, but they then faced arrest and incarceration and they were beaten up 
and threatened inside the jail as well. And what was a shock to us was that, uh, fortunately, they got bail eventually through the High Court, but they spent months and months in jail, and uh, very unfortunately, government lawyers defended their arrest, and those cases have still not been dropped. Let me just bring in Professor Amina Mohsen. The one thing is the sort of legal situation, and the other is, in a sense, whether given that there's a big sentiment out there that is anxious about the religious direction of the country, whether the government should be responsive to that. What do you think? I think government has taken different positions, you know. So people get confused. What is government's position on this? So religion has been used and misused. Sarah Hussain. Secular bloggers is not a monolithic term. And I think it's important to go back to what Shahbag was about. Certainly Shahbag was about these broader issues of seeking justice and demanding accountability. But you know, 20 years before Shahbag, there was an active movement for war crimes and trials. And that did not involve this one-point focus on the death penalty. I think we need to focus on the fact that the bloggers and others who were active in Shahbag were encouraging and inciting this one-point focusing, hang them, hang them, we must have hangings, getting three-year-old children to stand on the streets with nooses. They have to take some responsibility for having catalyzed this situation where you got then the uh, militants, extremists, and political opposition to the government exploited the situation to then turn this on its head and call for the death penalty for so-called blasphemers. Everything focused around who can you give the death penalty to and the fact that the demands for the death penalty became a legitimate thing to call which no one in 20 years for 40 years had seen that as the issue. They had seen bringing these people to trial and to account as the big issue. I think that was a, a horrific turn and a very unfortunate turn. I just want to go to our audience for anybody, any comments. I think people should be religious. It is a good thing. And if somebody do against religion, for any religion, they should be considered as criminal. Islamist groups have burned down Buddhist monastery in Ramu and also almost every year we see that uh, they're attacking the temples, they're uh, breaking up the statues. But we haven't seen such prompt action taken in case of those happenings. If secular bloggers can be arrested and uh, be tortured for uh, hurting religious uh, sentiments, why aren't those criminals being uh, arrested for hurting uh, the religious sentiments of other religions, apart from Islam? I just want to play a quick clip here from an internet user from the other side of the spectrum. So we've been talking about the government response to what happened after Shah Bagh, um, and we've also been talking about freedom of expression. Uh, Somebody called Talukta Shahbag is a blogger as well. He supports the Jamati Islami political party. Uh, That's not his real name. He spoke to us anonymously from Southeast Asia. He says he's gone there to avoid being detained by police because he says they see him as a political target, although the police would point out that party activists from all parties have been guilty of criminal acts, uh, especially during protests and so on. So he told me why he first started blogging. Bangladesh is a country which has a population of 160 million people who are almost 90% Muslim. The basis of our faith is that we are characterized by good morals and values. So in that sense, I believe that there should be a semblance of religion in the state. It should not be totally secular because that basically just takes away your identity. And I noticed that in the media, it was one sided to put it uh, very briefly. And freedom of expression is not something that you take for granted because you don't know how it is going to be used against you. So basically, I thought that maybe uh, someone needs to write the other side of the story. Now, you asked me if you could speak anonymously, that you didn't want to show your face. Why would you ask for something like that? Because I was involved with the Students' Islamist Movement that was in my university days. Because of that connection, I have been arrested, not once, twice. On the second instance, I had to endure two months in jail. I had to pay a bribe so that they did not push any charges against me, any uh, charges which were unfounded, basically. So for that, we had to pay up. I think the government or the authorities would say that there's a serious threat from Islamists in this country. I mean, witness the murder of bloggers or other terrorist acts, and that's why Islamists are getting arrested. Just giving the reason of a uh, death of a blogger is not an excuse to arrest hundreds of people without reason. Uh, this, this is just sheer manhandling of the issue. So that means they can have a stronger hold on the country. I mean, there is a list of... I think 84 bloggers who many supporters of Islamic parties accused of blasphemy. Do you agree that these guys had committed blasphemy and they, they should have been called up on that? I don't support such a list. 
And I think this is the work of some people who have so much grievances that they've actually lost track of who their real enemy is. They were angry about something else. They are from as, as small issues such as the traffic jam, to the food prices, to the living costs, to excesses by the government, to corruption, and to these things, uh, the blasphemy. This is just the tip of the iceberg, and if you take everything into account, people they just need some instance or the other to vent their anger and fury and frustration. But if people like this were to challenge the existence of God in an Islamic state, would they be guilty of, of committing a crime against the state? That would depend upon the laws prevalent. And if the majority of the people, if they would support the death of such people who have committed blasphemy, then obviously they are going to get that. Why should somebody be considered to have broken the law for saying what they think about God, whether God exists or not, or whether what they think about the role of God and religion in the state? Having belief in atheism is one thing, but that does not mean you have to use offensive language and vulgar words to put forward your message. I may not like it. You have to respect my view also. Speaking about God is something very high, right? But in Bangladesh, you can get arrested for criticizing the Prime Minister. If criticizing the Prime Minister warrants uh, somebody's arrest and uh, jail, then why not criticizing God? Because God is much more higher than the Prime Minister, right? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Minister of Information, Hassan al-Haq Inu. Yeah. I think the accusation is that, in general, freedom of speech is affected by, on both sides of the argument. How do you respond to that? Uh, the freedom of speech is not restricted. If you look at the uh, expanding mass media, for the last uh, six years, 600 plus newspapers have been registered and they are printing news. Uh, more than 40 television channels are in the private sector. So here, if you look at the mass media and the social media, everybody is criticizing the loopholes of the government or the certain misuse of the power or everything, corruption. So uh, nobody is arrested on that issue, criticizing the government. If you look into the process, here there is an organized attack on culture, organized attack on monuments, organized attack on secular people, or atheist people or non-atheist people. So it is not that attacks on the Hindus only or Buddhists only, they are attacking Muslims also. So where the government is taking an action on spear militants only, terrorists only, or the government is not taking any, any action, criticizing the government. One or two persons have been arrested not for propagating his views, but for misusing the media. Okay, thanks very much. We'll be back with much more on this deeply polarizing story after the BBC News. Reading will, you know, we're quite happy to be doing it. Uh, after the news, but also a much lighter story. And what is that about? That's about goats of Bangladesh. Goats, like what? Baha Baha goats? Yes. I guess that sounded more like sheep. Anyway, that's coming up on BBC Trending after the news. BBC New Journalists waiting the I was detained to enter the <laughs> Welcome back to BBC Trending. I am Mukul Devachan. We're on location here in Bangladesh. Hello, Dhaka. Come on, Achen. Ah, see you there, old bardo. Uh, with me is Sharmin Roma from BBC Bangla. Now, you've been looking into a video that has had millions of Facebook users angry in recent weeks. Yes, uh, a rather disturbing video has now been watched by millions showing a teenage boy in Silet of Bangladesh being attacked and killed. But the huge outcry in part from the internet seems to have prompted the justice system to act. Very interesting. More on that later. And also, what have goat selfies got to do with skin lightening cream? But for now, let me quickly introduce my panel. With us are Minister of Information Hassan al-Haq Inu, human rights lawyer Sarah Hussain, secular blogger Arif Jebtik and International Relations Professor Amina Mosin. Uh, it's to the matter now of how religious or secular a place Bangladesh should be that we will turn. In the last half of the program we were talking about so-called atheist bloggers and the spate of violence against them. In this section we'll be talking about where all of that controversy leaves the online political debate in Bangladesh and asking what effect this has all had on that vibrant free space that is the internet. Uh, at the moment, there is a great deal of division online, but it wasn't always so divided. Some years back, secular and atheist bloggers actually joined in with Islamic bloggers to raise money for a little girl. It's been nine long years since Koshik Ahmed, 
a secular blogger, last climbed these stairs and knocked on property's door. She opens and recognizes him. She's 14 now, but when they last met, she was a little girl from a humble background suffering from leukemia. He was part of a group of bloggers, Islamist bloggers and atheist bloggers alike. They enjoyed debating each other online back then, but they were united enough as friends to come together to raise a donation for property and help her to get treatment. Despite their different opinions and virtual fight with each other on religious ground, on political grounds, they were united to help one victim by a rare disease. And now it is quite absurd because now people are getting killed due to their different opinion. Prapti's smiling mother, Tamina, remembers the day the bloggers visited very well. We will never forget these bloggers and what they did for Prapti. If they hadn't helped us, she wouldn't be with us today. But today, says Kaushik, things are different. The threat of violence against secular bloggers means no one engages. Everyone has defriended everyone else on Facebook. For him, even childhood friendships are being undermined. Extremist groups say that the person who is against of religion, he has to be killed. My one childhood friend shared these things in his Facebook so he knows every of my details he could be a disaster for me he could be threatening for me so Koshik has defriended him and many others on Facebook sticking only to people he trusts mostly those who share his secular opinions like some people uh, just uh, it's uh, slang using slang for profit here's someone who has a very different opinion on the world Tribuj Alam, a conservative blogger with nearly a million regular readers to his website, was also in the same room working with atheists and helping Prapti nine years back. He's clearly denounced the recent murders of atheist bloggers that he once knew, but he says it wasn't just Islamists, it was the atheists and secular voices themselves who ruined things by turning very aggressive. They're using very offensive language for uh, Allah, like... They were actually making fun of... Yeah, uh, making fun of, but in a bad way, really bad way. Like, uh, they don't show a little respect for others. Is that their right? Should they be allowed? Uh, yeah, they have right to say anything, but uh, I think they should keep a limit. All of those who raised money for Prapti nine years ago were on Somewhere In. It's a homegrown Bangladeshi blogging platform which currently has 180,000 registered bloggers. But it's not a free-for-all website. And one of those who moderates it, Mujadid Al-Fazani Jadid, says that in the current febrile atmosphere, he's having to do a lot more blocking of extreme Islamists for sure, but also of many atheists and secular bloggers. I guess there is a difference between the hate speech and the freedom of speech. But your platform, you have blocked some atheists and secular uh, What kind of thing were they doing they are, that made you feel they were breaking the rules? Like when they are using the bad words, such bad words, which should not be published in social media. Given the violence deployed against atheists, yeah. do you think the rest of the blogging community is just a bit scared? Certainly. Listen, the blogger, the atheist blogger, they are not the icon of the whole blogging community. Uh, I just want to get some responses to that from our audience. I mean, BBC Trending, we cover the internet all over the world. It's quite a vibrant debate. Do you feel that the debate has been stifled by some of this uh, polarization? Secular people are throwing their secular stones and uh, uh, religious people are throwing their religious stones. So how could you uh, ensure the peaceful coexistence the concepts of secularism create conflicts with uh, religions. As a result, we see violence and murders. If secularism is for equality and for being open-minded, then why these ill events happened? I think it's okay if uh, the secular bloggers and uh, the Islamist bloggers or whatever religion they believe in, if, if they want to debate on something, that is fine. But I don't support that one will attack on someone or one will speak against someone or one would uh, offend someone.
Okay, thank you very much to all of you for those comments. Let me go to uh, so Arif Jeptak. You are secular in orientation and Islamic by faith. You've been on the internet for ages. Right. Do you think that this sort of, what's happened, ha ha has stifled the ability uh, to speak? Uh, the thing what happened on the practice case, I was involved in that campaign as well. We are the very early stage of blogger. The thing is actually not now how they are portraying it is a secular blogger, atheist blogger, Islamist militant blogger. It was not like that before. Actually, we respected each other. Even I had a, a very nice debate with Ovijit Roy once because I'm a believer he is not. But now what happened is they published my picture on the front page of a newspaper telling I'm an atheist, although I'm involved directly in the masjid management in my uh, community. Professor Amina Mose, you get the impression that there are two conversations happening separately in the country, that two groups of people just aren't speaking to each other. Is that right? Yes, that's right. The question is that why it is happening? When I talk about, you know, secular extremism and the kind of narratives that are being built in Bangladesh or around Bangladesh politics, nationalism has been taken to a point that even Arif was using these uh, terms like anti-liberation, pro-liberation. I'm facing this situation that whenever I'm critiquing something, I'm being labeled as a, a person who is supporting the anti-liberation group. It's like a situation where you are not, if you are not with me, you are with the other group, which I think is very unfortunate. Uh, Sarah Hussain. This term of atheist bloggers is unfortunately not only used by uh, parties like the Jamaat. When the government prosecuted the bloggers, the police wrote documents saying these are atheist bloggers and accusing them of the crime of atheist blogging, as if that's even a crime in Bangladesh. In terms of freedom of expression issues, I think it's important for us to remember how this intersects with religion. Our constitution actually says that you cannot give any political status to religion. At the same time, our constitution and a parliament in which our our minister was a member, actually said Islam is the state religion. Jamaat has not made Islam the state religion. No fundamentalist party, no war crimes party has made Islam the state religion. This government has made it. That's why is it playing? Why is it trying to play both sides? Why is it trying to have its cake and eat it? Final word on this vexed issue to Minister Inu. Well, when the first constitution was, the constitution was drafted in 1972, it was more or less democratic and secular with certain lapses here and there. So after this 75 military intervention, the military dictators scrapped many democratic articles and inserted certain articles. So one of them is state religion Islam. Okay. So it is not that uh, we inserted uh, the clause of state religion. Thanks very much on that issue. Let's move on to the next.